All right, let's rehearse questions 13 through 19. And just to remind you, uh, this is the section of the catechism on the doctrine of sin, which is hamartiology is the theological term. And it runs from 13 to 19, leading up to that after creation, and then followed by, of course, just the wonderful grace of God in our redemption. So it's interesting, if you, as you go through and study the catechism, it's really great to notice the sections and to bracket them out. Uh, so that while you're memorizing, you can memorize that section together and work on different sections at a time, possibly. Uh, but in either case, to be able to realize the connectiveness of all of the questions and answers as they flow one to the next. So question 13 this morning, did our first parents continue in the estate wherein they were created? First parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the estate wherein they were created by sinning against God. What is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. What was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created? The sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created was their eating the forbidden fruit. Did all mankind fall in Adam's first transgression? The covenant being made with Adam, not only for himself, but for his posterity, all mankind, descending from him by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. Into what estate did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate whereinto man fell? The sinfulness of that estate whereinto man fell consist in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. What is the misery of that estate whereinto man fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Amen. All right, we're looking at questions 17 and 18 this morning. As we get into the topic of the sinfulness of that estate. And by the way, just to remind you, I mentioned yesterday, the New Horizons magazine. Uh, I'm sure there will be some extras on the table in the back as soon as they come in. Uh, the Theology of the Westminster Standards in this great article, the opening article by Chad Van Dixhorn. So I encourage you to get a hold of that. And you can find it online as well. Just go to the website, I'm sure. But as we dig into this question this morning, particularly uh, question 18, we see uh, what has happened in the fall. The fall brought mankind at once into, a, into an estate of both sin and misery. Because it's in a state of sin... Uh, there is no true holiness ever attainable for any human being. We're born in sin. We're sinners by default. And because it's in a state of misery, there is no salvation ever to be had by any human being in the state in which he is found. If salvation is ever to be had, he has to be taken out of that estate. You can't be saved in it because there's no salvation in it. It's in a state of misery. No good can come out of it. No good can come into it. One must be rescued. I love B.B. Warfield's reference to the plan and the purpose of redemption. He speaks of it as God's rescue plan. That's really what it is. He sends Christ to the earth on a rescue mission because we have to be taken out of this estate and brought into a new estate. Do you remember the fourfold state of man? The state of innocence, the state of sin, the state of grace, the state of glory. We've got to travel out of sin, the state of sin, into the state of grace which can only be, question 20, praise God, can only be by a Redeemer. That Redeemer, is, question 21, is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at question 18 this morning, question 18 deals with some of the most profound and important matters in the whole range of revealed and experiential religion because it deals with who and what we are before God. We have to know this. That's why Calvin's grand, his magnum opus, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, begins with an understanding of ourselves, a knowledge of oneself. So interconnected, of course, as Calvin points out with the knowledge of God. Can't know one without knowing the other, at least in a natural sense. 
But we've got to know ourselves. We have to know where we are, the condition and the estate in which we are fixed, in which we are born, before we realize that we need a rescue out of it. And that's of course, of course, comes through the gospel that that provision is made in Christ. But we go wrong. You think of all of the false religions. Where do false religions begin? How does religion go awry? First of all, a false knowledge of self, which leads then and is directly connected with a false knowledge of God. And in every religion, man is raised above the state in which he is really found, and God is lowered below the state in which he is found. So God is brought down within our reach, and we're raised up within his reach, and salvation is easily attainable by works, and man builds a ladder of some sort to try to get to God. None of that is ever going to work. Every religion is damnable outside of the true religion of Christianity because only Christianity tells the truth about who we are, the state and the condition in which we're born, and who God is, completely other and outside of that, and what he has then done to rescue us. There's no ladder going up. There's only a ladder coming down. That's Jacob's ladder, the ladder of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which God set his foot on earth in the person of his son to raise us up. The answer to the question before us, looking at 18, it supplies a clear and careful and in every way admirable statement of what is known as Pauline, Augustinian, Calvinistic theology. It is, that's the nature of the confession because as, again, Warfield said, what is evangelicalism but Calvinism come to its own, right? Calvinism is the truth of the scripture. It is the teaching of the word of God. And that is found here so clearly in the catechism as a whole and in this particular question with regard to man and our condition. And this answer then declares to us in language the most scriptural and theologically exact, the guilt and the corruption of Adam and through him, the guilt and corruption of the entire human race. Again, where we are, who we are, and what we are before God. And the answer asserts that the sinfulness of our fallen condition, again, two, two descriptors of our fallen condition, there is a sinfulness at, uh, uh, with regard to it and a misery this morning looking at the sinfulness. The sinfulness consists in four things that we inherited from Adam as a result of our covenantal participation in the fall. These words are going to become, they need to become, and they're going to become much more familiar to you as we go through the catechism because the catechism builds. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. So when we say something this morning like this, the covenantal participation, that should ring a bell in your mind and you should remember how it is that we were created and how it is that Adam stood before God in a covenant relationship as the federal head of the human race. And we participated in that covenantally. So be sure to to grab these terms and these references and what they mean so that as we go through and, we, and these terms become, become more familiar, they don't need to be redefined in your head every time. So let's talk about these four things. The Catechism lays out four particular ways in which we uh, are in a sinful condition. First of all, we've received the guilt of Adam's first sin. The guilt of Adam's first sin was imputed, credited to all his posterity. We're exposed to punishment before God and his law. Why? On account of Adam's first sin. And the reason for this is because we all stood in the same covenant with Adam. Naturally, because he was our first father, right? The father of the race, as Acts 17 makes very clear. But also morally and covenantally, right? How Adam fared in the probation, in the test, was how the human race fared. That pleased God to arrange it that way because it pleased him to to raise up the elect in Christ, and therefore it pleased him to deal with humanity in Adam, the first and the second Adam. And the key to understand here is because this guilt is imputed to us federally, we're born with this guilt. Right? In other words, it isn't imputed to us on the basis of something we will then do in our own person, but something that was done on our behalf in the first person, in our head. Our federal representative as the Classic example, if the president decides to go to war with another nation, he makes that decision federally. That is, as the federal head, in a governmental and national sense, a federal representative of the United States. So if the president decides to go to war, whom we have elected as our federal representative, then we all go to war. We may not all, we may not all take up arms, but as a nation, we're at war. And as a nation, we fund the war effort. 
we're all engaged, we're all involved, and we all hang in the balance in terms of the outcome of that war. The federally, Adam represented us, and so we are born with this guilt. Look at Romans 5. This would be the passage that we always have to come back to when we think of this relationship, our being in Adam and then, of course, in Christ. Romans 5, verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass, and you see in verse 12, we're, only, we're talking about the trespass of Adam and his first trespass. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, which can only refer to Christ's act of righteousness, leads to justification in life for all men. So there are two federal heads, which Paul makes very clear in Romans 5, verses 12 to the end. Two federal heads that God has provided by which he will deal with the human race. We're all dealt with covenantally and federally in Adam to begin with. And after that fall, which consigns the entire human race to guilt and condemnation, the elect are dealt with before the foundation of the world. The elect are dealt with in Christ, the federal head of the church. So we're born with this guilt. Through that one trespass, condemnation has come to us all. How can condemnation come to anyone unless there is guilt? Only the guilty are condemned. The righteous are justified. But the guilty are by necessity before God condemned by his law. So when we're conceived and come into being in our mother's womb, we come into being with this guilt. We come into being as sinners. This is what David means when he talks about in, in Psalm 51.5. In sin, my mother conceived me, right? In sin. Not that she was sinning and doing it, as some people like to interpret it. Look at the passage itself, and more importantly, place Psalm 51.5 against the backdrop of the rest of Scripture. Romans 5, for instance, Ephesians 2, for instance, and it becomes very clear that David isn't speaking about something his mother did. He's speaking about his own condition. David's talking about his guilt and shame before God as the chapter opens. Remember, this comes out of the guilt with Bathsheba and the sin against Bathsheba, and he talks about his guilt and his shame, and as he says, you are right when you judge. I'm guilty. You point the finger at me, as Nathan did, and said, you're the man. You are right. As a matter of fact, not only guilty from that, I'm guilty as a sinner at my very core. I was brought forth in sin, conceived in sin. I was born a sinner. So we don't come into being on, ne on neutral ground. Man isn't basically good. That's a lie, a philosophy, and a lie of... of the whole normal way of thinking, right, in our, in our contemporary day. We're not coming into this world on neutral ground. We're not basically good. We're basically evil. We're sinners because we're born sons of Adam. We're born covenant breakers. Turn to Genesis 5 and notice this. So much of what is said, as we've already looked at this in several occasions before, so much of what is said in the Old Testament needs the light of the New Testament to clarify. And praise God, we read from the eyes of the New Testament when we go back to the Old Testament. And so we see what's here. Uh, to read it as it stands, one may not be able to see the depth of what's here, but by the fullness of God's revelation, we see exactly what God is saying. So look at Genesis 5, verse 1. <clears throat> this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. See the difference? Adam, we're told, was made in the image of God, which we know, Genesis 1.26, Genesis 2. Adam was made in the image of God, but then when Adam has a son, notice what Scripture says. And it says it twice. He fathered a son in his own likeness after his image. The two words and the two manner by which God spoke of man being created after his likeness and his image in Genesis 1.26. And now Adam. And what state is Adam in in this, in this situation? Well, he can only bring forth a sinner. And that's what Seth is. And all of us then. Look at Genesis 6.5 as the Lord assesses the human race. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every, only, continually. That's man. That's the condition in which he lives. That's how he conducts himself. 
because at core, at his core, man is a sinner. Job 14, verse 4, can anything, anyone bring something clean out of that which is unclean? Of course not. We're born under God's condemnation as children of God's wrath, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 2. We're born children of disobedience, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 5, just like the rest of mankind. Think of it in terms of God's Christ words to Nicodemus in John 3, 3 and 3, 5. You must be born again. No one can either see or enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What is Christ hinting at? There's a lot there. But it at least means this much. Something is wrong, inherently wrong with the first birth. If we need to be born again. We're not born neutral with the possibility of being saved. We're born lost in desperate need of a rescue by the grace and mercy of God. There's something wrong at the first birth. There's something wrong with the condition in which we are naturally born. We're born covenant breakers. We're born sinners. The proofs of our guilt are many. And look at the verses there. We've already referenced several of them. Scripture affirms the guilt of mankind, even from the womb, without equivocation. Psalm 58, verse 3 says, We come forth from the womb speaking lies. You don't have to teach your children to lie. You have to teach them to tell the truth. Why is that? Because of the terrible twos? Right? It's more than that. Right? We can go all the way up to the terrible threes and the terrible teenagers and the terrible adults. Right? It never ends. Because there's something wrong inside. There's a natural condition. The nature is, is not what it should be. It's fallen. It's sinful. So our own children then provide inescapable proof. And think of it this way as well. Why did God command, as he established a covenant in chapter 17 of Genesis with Abraham and with the church through Abraham, the father of the faithful, why did God command that the children be circumcised? What did circumcision signify? The cutting off of the foreskin of the flesh. The circumcision, Moses later makes very clear, it's a circumcision of your heart that God is after. That's what that points to. This is a true Jew, says Paul in Romans 2. Not one who is circumcised in his flesh, but one who is circumcised in his heart by the Spirit of God. That's a true Israelite. An Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile, as Jesus will say of Nathaniel. That's what the circumcision of the foreskin is pointing to. Why is that done to our children at eight days old? Why? To signify that there's something wrong, even at the very core, even at the very beginning, even in infancy. And furthermore, on that very text and coming in the New Testament, why, are, why does God command that our children be baptized? Unless they need the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Right? We preached on this some time ago, one of my baptism sermons, pointing out that what are we saying when we bring our children for baptism? We're agreeing with God that they're dirty and that only he can wash them. And our prayer is that the waters of the baptism would point to the washing of his Holy Spirit. And that is what it points to, but that it will be done for them by his grace. Why do our children need discipline? Why is folly bound up in the heart of a child and you need a rod to drive it out? Why? <coughs> Something is wrong inside, right? Why do our children learn no before they learn yes? Right? When they learn to start repeating you, it's always no, because that's what you've been saying, right? That's why they learn it. So consider how early Adam's image his fallen image appear in our, appears in our children even before they come to the use of reason and how it continues with them throughout their entire life. In our children, what do we see? At the earliest age, we see pride. We see ambition. We see envy. We see jealousy. Just think of the sibling rivalry. Think of the fights over toys at such a young age. We haven't taught them to be greedy. We haven't taught them to be jealous. We're trying to teach them to share. Because that's the right thing to do. But that's not what they want to do. Why? Something's wrong with their nature. We see obstinacy. We see incorrigibleness, lust, anger, idolatry. All proof of the sinfulness of their nature. No one teaches children to do evil. Instead, we spend our whole lives trying to teach them to do good. Evil comes natural. The proof is everywhere. And we don't need to look at our children. We just need to look in the mirror. Right? Let's be honest. It's easy to point to our children, but we shouldn't be surprised when we look at ourselves. We're just the same. So we have received from Adam 
as part of the sinfulness of our fallen condition, the guilt of his first transgression. After that, you remember, he was a private person. But in that probation, covenantally and federally, he was a public person, the first Adam. And the entire human race hung in the balance. Secondly, then, we receive from Adam, as characterizing the, the sinfulness of our fallen condition, the want of original righteousness. That old word want, of course, meaning lack or loss. Original righteousness, we've already looked at. We talked about man being created in the image of God, an earlier question. Original righteousness is that entire <coughs> rectitude, that moral uprightness of all the faculties of man with which he was created. Man's soul was adorned with this rectitude. In every part, he was made in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness after the image of God with dominion over the creatures. But that rectitude, that original rectitude found in the estate of innocence, it is gone. 100% gone. Not a vestige is left. So let's talk through this for a moment. First of all, thinking of knowledge, righteousness, righteousness, and holiness, the mind, the will, and the affections, all right? We looked at this already. The right knowledge of God in the mind, which Adam had, which man had, is gone. Adam had a right knowledge of his creator and his Lord, his lawgiver. He had a right knowledge of him. But that's gone. I, the knowledge that is left is twisted. Do we know God? Romans 1 says very clearly we know God. But what's the problem? The knowledge we have of God now is twisted by our fallenness. And so it's twisted by hatred and anger and malice. And so that as Paul says, now we refuse to acknowledge God as God. We refuse to be thankful or worship Him as God. And instead, we do the unthinkable. And we ascribe the attributes and we take the glory of God and try to rob Him of it and we ascribe it to the creatures so that we worship wood and stone, indeed our very selves. And we hope by any means to rob God of his glory. And we continue in our rebellion against God at all costs. Look at Pharaoh. He had every reason and incentive and encouragement. Even his own people said, we're going to be destroyed if we keep going like this. Just let Israel go. And yet he hardened his heart willfully. Pharaoh was raised up by God as the perfect example of the persistent rebellion of the human heart in the face of Almighty God himself. In the very face of God. Even his own magicians wound up saying, this is the finger of God. Period. The Lord says, let my people go. Surely by then no one would resist, but he did. Why? That's the human heart. The candlestick remains in every man. You remember the, the constitutional image? We're still in the image of God. It's very clear from Genesis 9 where it talks about capital punishment. Why? Because the one to kill a person is to kill the image of God, one who bears the image of God. And even in, as far in the New Testament as James 3, right? We bless one another, we curse one another, who has made the image of God. My brother, these, these things ought not to be. So the image of God persists constitutionally because, well, it can't but exist. It will exist in hell as far as fallen man. But the moral image is gone. And so our hearts are darkened. The understanding is darkened by sin, being alienated from the life and light of God through willful ignorance. Turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 17 and 19, Paul's speaking of the Gentiles here. He's speaking, in fact, of what the church to whom he writes was before. And in essence, he's speaking of mankind, period. Verse 17 of Ephesians 4, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. How do they walk? In the futility of their minds. Their minds work in futility. Romans 1, remember? They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. It's a willful ignorance. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's natural man. That's this fallenness. So the right knowledge of God in the mind, it's gone. How about the righteousness of man's will with which he was created? Remember, we were bent toward good, right? That's gone. If you, Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made man upright, remember, but he has sought out many inventions. Right? 
Isaiah 53, 6, we have each, we have all, each and every one of us, gone our own way. We had a righteousness in our will, in alignment with God's will for us, in our creation, bent toward good, but that's gone. Romans 7, verse 18, those who are in the flesh, what? Cannot, cannot please God. Now man can do nothing but sin. Every thought, word, and deed, and motive is tainted with sin. However pure man tries to be, every water coming out of him is coming out of a dirty channel. His freedom, right? Because remember, free will continues with man in every estate, right? Free will continues in every estate as part of the, part of the constitutional image of God. But now that freedom is in bondage. Quite a paradox. His freedom is now enslaved. Because remember, our free will is determined by our what? Our nature. Our nature is determined by our what? Our condition. So is man free? Is the sinner free? Absolutely. Look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh did exactly what he wanted to do. He was free in hardening his heart, and he did it. Right. But now, that freedom is enslaved to our fallen, rebellious, corrupt nature. And we have lost all ability, all ability, and therefore every inclination to choose good and please God. Romans 7, 18. We can't please God. But then again, neither do we want to. That's why when, when the responder in Romans chapter 9 says, but who am I to resist God's will? He made me this way. Who are you, O oh man, to reply against God? There's no place to stand and accuse God. Yes, we're fallen. Our freedom is bound to sin. But ask a sinner if he wants to do what God wants him to do, and he'll tell you no. So it's not a matter of can't so much as a matter of won't. And that's where God puts the blame on the won't. Is there a can't? Of course there's a can't. Where'd the can't come from? My own fault. My rebellion resulted in the can't. Because when I could... I chose not to. Right? That's what happened in Adam. Now we can't. It's our own fault. God can't be blamed for it. But neither do I want to. So we see in Matthew 23, Jesus cries out over Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how long I have longed to gather you. But what? You would not. It's very clear. You would not. Christ didn't cry out. I would have gathered you so many times, but you're not elect. I would have gathered you so many times that you can't come anyway. You would not. The blame is on man. So the right knowledge of God in the mind, gone. The righteousness of the will, gone. And therefore, thirdly, the holiness and the purity of man's affections with which he was created is also gone. Our affections for spiritual things, that is, the things of God, our affections for spiritual things have taken the wing, and we are left like a bird without wings. So what do we do? Interestingly, we crawl on the ground like a serpent, just like our father, the devil. Bent on vanity, worldliness, earthly mindedness, and we feed on dirt. What do we mean by that? We love what we ought not to love. We hate what we ought not to hate. Our affections are upside down. We call evil good and we call good evil. We don't agree with God on his assessment of anything. Ourselves, the world in which we live, sin, the law. We cannot desire or even see the truly good and we are bent on desiring and pursuing and chasing after and dying for the apparently good, which is actually truly evil and self-destructive. Are you beginning to see the sinfulness of our fallen condition? And how foolish it is for every false religion and philosophy, how foolish it is for any disposition to begin with the assumption that man is basically good. That man's fault and problem is outside himself. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. Why? Because out of the heart come evil thoughts, adultery, deceit, and all manner of sinfulness. 
Thirdly, then, the corruption of our whole nature. So we've got the guilt of Adam's first trans transgression, the want of original righteousness, and now thirdly, the corruption of our whole nature, which is commonly called original sin. Right? This corruption that we receive from Adam, a corruption of our whole nature, this is what's commonly called original sin. Augustine, I believe, from what I've read, Augustine first coined that term. It's important to see at this, at this point that the fall of mankind in Adam is more than a fall from something, right? The second point, we fell from our original righteousness, from fellowship with God, right? It's more than a fall from something. It's a fall into something. We didn't fall, as it were, from positive to zero. We fell from positive to negative, right? We were talking about this in men's fellowship the other night a little bit. And what did we fall into? We fall into a most terrible, lamentable, and damnable condition. We fell into an entire corruption and pollution of our nature such that we now have not only no disposition and inclination to do good, as if we were just zero, we now have an entire disposition and inclination to do evil. It's the negative, you see. We have fallen into something, into corruption, into pollution. And theologically, we, we describe this as saying that man is totally or wholly depraved. The natural depravity, or in older, older writings, pravity of man. We're depraved. So let's think of this, the extent of this depravity and corruption. First of all, all men are corrupted. How far does this depravity that Adam that Adam bequeathed to the human race, how far does it go? Well, it goes to every single human being. There's no exception of anyone among all those born of Adam by ordinary generation. Right? It becomes very clear. Adam was able to bring forth a son in his own image, and that's all he could do. And that passes down through the entire human race. And the reason we say by ordinary generation is because that's how the catechism words it, because what is the cate catechism preparing for? That there was one born... Right? as a son of Adam, with the same flesh as ours, not by ordinary generation. This, in fact, as we will see, is what excluded Christ from receiving that natural corruption, because you can't be born of Adam by natural generation and not receive it. So the fact that Christ had to be supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin by the Holy Spirit proves that you can't escape it without some supernatural intervention. To be born a human being in this world is to be born in the sinfulness of this fallen condition. There's only one way out of it, by supernatural incarnation, supernatural conception, which is exactly what happened in Christ's case, which is why the catechism captures this wording, every man by ordinary generation. Even the children of holy parents are corrupted. Every circumcised father begets an uncircumcised child. So think then, so think then of the, first of all, then the, Think of the extent of this corruption. First of all, all men are corrupted. But secondly, and here's where we now focus in on, secondly, all of every man is corrupted. In other words, the whole man, not just everybody, but every part of everybody, our whole selves. It's a leprosy infecting his whole nature. It's a leaven leavening his whole lump. And then we can walk back through these just quickly again that we just looked at. Our understanding. We lost the right knowledge of God. And now what do we have? Our understanding, as we already saw from Ephesians 5, it's darkened. Our understanding is dead to spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive, the, spirit, receive the, the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot receive them. Why? Because they're spiritually, you should see a capital S there, spiritually discerned. You have to have the Holy Spirit to understand and receive and see the things of God. If you don't, you cannot receive them. Our understanding is darkened. It's dead. Our will, well, our will is free to evil, but not to good. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3, as we've referenced already. Born children of wrath, dead in trespasses and sins. That's our natural condition. Following the prince of the power of the air like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath. We are averse to good. We love sin like the fish loves the water. Take us away from our sin, we will find a way back. And if there's no way back to the sin we love... We'll just pick up another one, right? This is how the devil deceives us. We think that we've overcome a certain evil, and all he's done is exchange tit for tat. 
He just got you hooked on something else. We're inclined to evil. Hosea 11, verse 7, God says of his people, we are inclined. Why are we so bent on evil? Again, our fallenness. This is a corruption that runs through our whole selves. If we were to set sin and duty, death and life, cursing and blessing before the natural man, left to himself, he will choose sin and death and cursing every single time. Doesn't make any sense unless there's a natural, innate, inherent problem. Man is naturally crossed to the will of God. In fact, God's forbidding something is the strongest motive to do it. What do children want? The very thing they're told they can't have. They don't want what they can have. There's no fun in that. I want what I can't have. I want what it's off limits. That's the natural heart of man. No fruit is sweet but the forbidden fruit. Stolen bread is sweet. Not because it's sweet, because no sin can truly be sweet. Only God is sweet, and Christ is sweetest of all. If stolen waters and stolen bread are sweet, the problem isn't with the bread so much as with our palate. We find it sweet. It's sweet to our palate. Our affections, again, they're all disordered. When we were innocent, man was made right side up, if you will. His reason was subject to God's law. His affections were subject to his reason. But now our affections run away like a horse with a rider. We can't control them. Boston has a wonderful quote. Now that man, though created right, right side up, is now completely upside down. See if this resonates with you. Boston speaks of the natural man and says, His heart is where his feet should be, fixed on the earth. His heels are lifted up against heaven, which his heart should be set upon. He loves what he should hate. He hates what he should love. He joys in what he ought to mourn for. And he mourns for what he should rejoice in. He glories in his shame, and he's ashamed of his glory. He abhors what he should desire, and he desires what he should abhor. He in every way acts in direct opposition to the apostolical injunction of seeking those things which are above, Colossians 3. It's not what natural man does. It's what he was created to do. It's not what he does. It's not what he does. It's not what he wants to. And whenever man lands his affections on lawful objects, when he lays hold of things that are good in and of themselves, and let's face it, man does, yet there's still a problem. Even when he's loving the right things, he can't love them aright because he overloves them. He can't use them because he can't keep from abusing them. So he takes the good gifts of God and he abuses them. He takes the good gifts of God and uses them on his own pleasures and sins. He can't esteem any good thing without idolizing it, worshiping it, serving it, dying for it, giving his whole self to it. He is all messed up. And it's not just a corruption on the inside. Here's another problem. This corruption runs to our body as well. What Paul says in Romans 7 is the body of death. Our bodies are a problem because of sin. What does the body do? Paul speaks of the body of death because he talks about his body. Our bodies incline us and incite us to evil. They tempt us. The body is supposed to be in service to the soul. The body is the means by which the soul does its acting. It acts out, if you will. Right? The hands are the hands of the soul to serve God. The eyes to adore the Lord, to read the word. The soul is to live out through the body. That's why man is made the way he is. But now, given our fallenness, every member of our body, Romans 6 says, every member of our body is in the service of sin as what, what does Paul call them? Members of unrighteousness. The eyes and ears made for God, they are windows through which temptations enter the soul. And what do we do with the eyes? Do we set them on things above? No, we lust after the things below. How many truths do you hear and just ignore? But the minute gossip comes your way, what do your ears do? Oh my goodness, what did you say about her? 
I didn't know that about him. Right? Immediately. Why are we so attuned to these things? The tongue is an unruly evil, James 3. Defiling the whole man. The throat is an open grave, Romans 3. The feet are swift to shed blood, Romans 3. The belly is a god, Philippians 2. The entire body is an armory for the devil. The devil uses everything because we're given over in our slavery unto sin and the devil. The very source of it all, the core of man's corruption, of course, is the heart. Matthew 12, Mark 7, Jesus says, out of the heart comes these things. Genesis 6, 5, every thought of man's heart, right, is only evil continually. And all this corruption is natural to us. Fourthly, the last thing, the corruption of our whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. The corruption of our nature, that original sin, that's the cause of sin, all the sins on our account. What this means is we sin in life because we're sinners in nature. So this total depravity is obviously a problem to the whole man. But it has consequences. It has results. There's, there's fruit to that disposition. And all the actual transgressions of which we become guilty as human beings accountable to God, they flow out of that natural corruption. That's the root. question is often asked, right? Are we sinners because we sin so that we're described by our actions? Or do we sin because we're sinners so that we act out of our nature? Right? It's the other, isn't it? It's the latter. Right? The reason isn't just our acting, as if we can change our acting. We can all change what we do. We can change our clothes. We can change our habits. We can adopt new habits, put down old habits. We can stop doing the things that are not approved, that are unacceptable in society. We can all put a, turn over a new leaf and become good people. But the problem isn't the acting, is it? It's the nature. The person has to be accepted before the actions are accepted. Right? That's why God looks at the heart first. That's why regeneration and the saving work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit aims at the heart. It is an arrow of God's transforming grace to the heart of man to begin the change where it must begin in his nature. And we become born again. A new heart, a new spirit, my spirit I put within you. And the end result, over time and ultimately in glory, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. We sin in life because we're sinners in nature. So we can't blame the devil. Let Philip Wilson do that. We can't blame our parents. We can't blame society. We can't blame our culture. Think of all the ways in which today's thinking realizes that, that there is blame. Right? Everyone understands there's blame because we all understand somebody's got to pay. Right? Somebody's got to pay. But it's not me. It can't be me because if there's anything I know... I know this, I'm basically good. If I begin with that, then the blame has to be outside of me. So you blame your upbringing, blame your childhood, blame your culture, blame social media, blame your peers, blame the fact that you were public schooled, should have been homeschooled, things would have been so much better. And on and on and on we go to try to pass the buck instead of realizing that any external change, we're still the same person. We need an internal transformation. We need to be born again. The condition in which we're born is one out of which no good can ever come and no salvation can ever be found. We need a rescue. And as we stand before God in Adam, we're all guilty of original sin. We're born in that condition. Infants dying in the womb, unless they are elect by the grace of God, and they go to be with him in glory, covered by the same blood of Christ as you, unless they are elect in God and go with him in glory, infants dying in the womb go to hell. They go to hell. Have they committed actual transgressions? No. Obviously. But there's more of a problem than just the fourth. Right? The fourth element in this answer isn't the only problem. Right? If it were, then there would be ages of innocence. And children would be born little angels that were just led astray by culture or family or whatever else. The Bible makes very clear 
the human race was dealt with in Adam. The human race is guilty. The elect will be rescued by God's grace. Are there elect infants? Yes. Right? John the Baptist leaped in the womb. Right? Jeremiah was called from the womb. God can do anything he pleases. Right? God can save without faith in that sense. But if anyone is in earshot, you're not getting saved without faith. If you understand what I'm saying to you today, unless you repent, you will, you will perish. Unless you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell in Adam. Right? Because we're accountable now. We understand, don't we? So we're all guilty of original sin, and as we grow to know our own mind and heart, and we become aware of the law written on our heart, and the God to whom we're accountable, we become guilty of all the actual transgressions which arise from our sinful nature as fruit from the root, waters from the spring. So the sinfulness of our condition is that we're born sinners in sin unto sin. The problem is, if that's not remedied, we will do nothing but continue to sin. And every day is a day of more guilt on this earth. Every day is a day of more guilt on this earth. We need to rescue. God needs to rescue us. That's why we bring the gospel to our children. That God may rescue them in their earliest years by his grace. A few reflections before we close. To say that man is totally depraved, and I'm sure you've read that and heard that term, to say that man is totally depraved doesn't mean that he's as bad as the devil or that every man is as bad as every other man or that every man is as bad as he could be or maybe one day will be. It means the man is all wrong in all things all the time. He's totally depraved. There is nothing man does that is good. In the flesh, Romans 8, you cannot please God. Sin has corrupted every part of his nature, rendered him unable to do any spiritual good ever. A couple of things for you to think about, I'll move on. But in Adam, the person corrupted the nature. But in his children, the nature corrupts the person. Another thing, all vices are in all but all are not active or extant in all. That's really important to grasp for your own confession to God. It is so easy to be critical of others and point the finger at others, especially when they fall into gross sin. What you need to understand is the seed of every sin is in you because sin is in you. As an entity, if you will, it's in you, right? You are capable of any and every sin that could ever be imagined. You could do it. We think we're beyond things. We think there's no way I would ever do that. Yes, there is a way. If God were to lift his hand and leave you to yourself. This is what God does in scripture often, right? It's what he did with David and Bathsheba. To think that even Peter, the beloved Peter, would be the one to rebuke the Lord. No one spoke more. Christ didn't speak as strongly to anyone as he did to Peter when he rebuked him. How could Peter do that, right? That's what's in every single one of us. We may not be acting out in all of those sins, but the seed of every sin is in us. This is why we're called to be watchful, watchful and prayerful. What is it that keeps us from being as bad as we can be and that keeps the corruption of our nature from acting out to the fullest extent of its natural bent and desires? God. It's grace. Not only grace in the lives of God's people, obviously, but even common grace. This is how we can go to bed at night and our neighbors leave us alone. This is how we can go to bed at night and rest peacefully and don't have ourselves robbed of all that belongs to us or even our bodies murdered by our neighbor, who's a sinner. God maintains by his common grace peace in the world for his church to prosper and for his elect to be redeemed and sanctified. It is his grace that keeps us here. How then do we explain the many praiseworthy things that man can and does do? Sinners do a lot of good things. Cyrus sent the Jews home, right? Sinners do a lot of good things. How do we explain that? Well, essentially, they are radically defective. They are defective at the core. We look at the outside, right, as the Lord said to Samuel. We look at the outside and judge a man by what we see on the outside, right, by his acts, by his works. Well, he's a good man. God looks at the inside and judges a man's works by what's inside. So God looks at the heart to judge the works. We look at the heart, not the works, to judge the heart. Obviously, that's a faulty way to do it. It's the only thing we can do. But the works, although they may look good, 
they're radically defective when they come from an unbeliever because of three things. The three parts of a good work are these. Those works are not prompted by love to God. They're not done about, out of obedience to God, and they're not offered through the mediation of Jesus Christ. Those are the three requirements of a good work. Look at your catechism, or your confession, rather. But instead, all the good works of unbelievers are done upon selfish motives to selfish ends with a selfish pride. The three defiling marks of a good work. That's what ruins it. So it can be good, and it can be used for God too good, and they, they can even be a blessing. The world can be a blessing to the church. Unbelievers can do good things for God's people, and history is full of that, not to mention Scripture. Do those works then earn anything before God for those on behalf of those people? Of course not. Because the persons have to be accepted in order for the works to be accepted. If the person isn't in a right standing, then there is no work that can possibly be done that would please God. But what happens when the person is accepted in Christ? All of a sudden, the works are accepted. Why? Because we all of a sudden do perfect works with the right motives all the time? Absolutely not. But like all the crazy pictures of our children and grandchildren on the refrigerator that are nonsense with crayons on white paper. They're acceptable to parents. They're beautiful to grandparents. Because the person is accepted. My child can't draw a bad picture. Right? Don't you laugh about my child's picture. It's beautiful. Don't make fun of it. Right? We get defensive, don't we? Why? Because the person is accepted. They can do no wrong in that sense. We know that as parents, how much more by our Heavenly Father, who by the grace and the mercy and the blood of Christ covers and washes and crowns and rewards what we do that is never, ever truly, fully good. It's just sanctified by the blood of Jesus. It's amazing. We never do a good work in that sense. But we sincerely desire to please our Father as our children sincerely desire to draw something beautiful. Does our new birth in Christ remove this innate corruption? No. The corruption remains. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't cry out the way he does as a believer in Romans 7. <laughs> the remnant of sin, I find in myself a law, another law in my members, sin in me. What's the sad experience of every true child of God? A war, Romans 7. I fight. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing. The evil I would not do, I find myself doing. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Wretched man that I am. Thanks be to God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Boom, immediately in the same breath, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has freed us, delivered us from the law of sin and death. Why is there no ground for parents to be proud on account of their child's beauty or compliant behavior? You might have a nice little child who does everything you say. Beautiful little girl, beautiful little boy. Why do you have no reason to boast? Because behind that outside is an ugly inside without the grace of God. Right? They have fair faces, foul souls. Whatever natural beauty they have is outweighed by a spiritual ugliness. A sinner... And we know that. So it's not only an act of obedience to bring our children to the waters of baptism, but it's also the ground of our most important plea to God. That as the sign and seal of the covenant are put upon our children in obedience to him, he would be gracious to pour out his spirit on our offspring and to redeem and to save our children, to wash them with the spirit in the waters of regeneration, which those waters signify, and that they would be hidden and cleansed in Christ's atoning blood. We see here the absolute necessity that we all have for Christ as a Savior. Christ alone, which is where these, this section on sin leads. Question 20, 21, and on down. Christ alone is able to save us from the guilt of sin by his blood, from the pollution of sin by the washing of regeneration in the Holy Spirit, and from the dominion of sin by the power of his grace. And this he all does when by his grace we are born again. I hope you're thinking already back to the, what we've learned in 1 Peter. Blessed be our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused you to be born again. Remember, that's where verse 3 begins. Changes everything. Finally, see the absolute necessity of the grace of mortification for us as Christians, by which we strive daily to crucify the flesh, the sin in us, 
and to put to death all that is earthly in us, as Paul says in Colossians 3. Why? Why is mortification so important? Because all your actual transgressions proceed from that spring. They come from that fountain. This is why the work of mortification is to be a daily work and an inner work. We're not looking to change the outside and ignore the inside. We're looking to, by God's grace, work on the inside. Our motives, our desires, our thoughts. Even as God works by his spirit. So that that will then change how we conduct ourselves in this world in an external manner. The reason we do different is because God's made us different. As we see in 1 Peter again, we have become children of obedience because we've been born again. And we are new in Christ. Brought us right up to the time here. I pray that that's encouraging to you. I pray that it helps you see yourselves more truly. And praise God for salvation. But don't forget that this sin is still in you. This sinful tendency, this fallen nature is still in you. Right? God deals with our flesh by way of crucifixion, just as he dealt with his son. And the crucifixion is a slow death. Right? It's a slow death, but it will finally one day be done when Christ comes. And it will breathe its last and give up the ghost. And we shall be forever free of it. Lord willing, next week we'll look at the misery of this condition and bring these two together like the catechism does. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for hard truths. We say as those did in John 6, this is a hard saying, who can bear it? But by your grace, we can bear it. Lord, we want to know this truth. We want to know better and better, Lord, the truths about ourselves, who and what we are before you in our own nature, in Adam. And let us reckon with that, Lord, and give glory to you and praise to you if we have been brought out of that by the rescue of our Savior. Let us pray for our children, who, short of your saving grace, are born into that condition. Let us pray for our friends and loved ones, who are outside of Christ, who are still in this condition. Let us indeed pray more fervently and diligently for your saving work, that you would intervene, that you would rescue and redeem those whom we love. Bless us, O God, and carry us with this knowledge today to a more holy walk before you, a more careful walk before you. Make us more watchful over our own hearts and minds. For out of the heart of man proceeds these things. Sanctify us more deeply today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.